This is probably the most important workshop in this conference. And it's good that you're here. Because this workshop is connecting big money with very big challenges. Sustainable finance and building projects to the EU taxonomy and the building performance gap. This is an extremely important issue that we have and it's connecting two worlds. It's connecting the very technical world that probably most of all you know very well with the financial world, with this probably very distant world from the uh, technical or engineering world. We are trying to connect this. Um, we worked on this, on, on this issue within the Quest project, a project funded within Horizon 2020 for the last three years. This is our final event um, on, on this uh, project. Um, and I think, this is my personal opinion, I think the connection between the financial world, those heavy investments that are necessary for a building stock, and the technical community, the technical understanding of buildings is extremely important, otherwise those investments are at risk. So we better think about this and find good solutions, good approaches here. Um, and to set the stage for this issue, I would ask, I would ask Frank of Orca, Riva, past president, to introduce the issue to us. Frank, please. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Wow, it's better, huh? it's, it's like an echo. I have a feeling that I'm in the church and I will deliver you the speech for the right faith. So here we are going to talk a little bit about uh, digitalization and, uh, and how the financial uh, world see your job and how it can be translated. Oh, sorry, I have to go first with the agenda, but we didn't go through. No, no problem. I will do it. So, uh, we will use the agenda. So, we have uh, some discussions, presentation, and then discussions. Uh, I will start with trying to set the scene, and then uh, we will go further with uh, Stefan uh, presentation, and then Ola Tyson, and we will have a first panel discussion about the topic and the research that was made by Quest. So, uh, my name is Frank Hovoka, I'm the past president of RIVA. I'm also a uh, member of the European Board of the Royal Institute of Chartered Surveyors. It's a UK-based organization dedicated to building valuation, uh, financial building valuation. And I'm also the chair of a French chapter of Building Smart International. So, I will try first to go with uh, what you saw uh, with uh, Pau this morning. We spoke a lot about uh, uh, European uh, Building Performance Directive revision and recast. In the same time, you have the Energy Efficiency uh, Directive recast plus uh, Renewable Energy recast. But there is also a very important one, which is done by the DG Grow, uh, and it's about uh, all the Commission will work on uh, digitalization. Oh, I lost. Did I did something wrong? No, thank you. Uh, it's about how the commission and the DG Grow, that is not here. DG Grow is the DG in charge of uh, industry and uh, companies. Uh, and the DG Grow uh, is working now on a working document about transition for resilient, greener, and more digital construction system. So here we are. We are talking about how we can use uh, the digital tools, the digital twins, uh, for a better understanding about the greenhouse gas emission, the real performance of buildings, and how we can really shift to uh, something that can be understandable and track what we can track. The other uh, work I didn't quote here, because I think you all know about, is what was done by the DG FISMA. DG FISMA, for the non-European, is the DG which is in charge of the finance. And they did a work for the green finance, and they have a sustainability finance group. And they released last year what we call the taxonomy. And inside the 1,000 
page of a document, you will find some pages dedicated to green building. So you have a definition by the DG FISMA, what is a sustainable green building, a new one, or an existing building. So, and it's, here starts the point, because in the same time, we will have also to put in place for big investors and banks and real estate developers uh, the new law and the new regulation based on reporting. So we will have from next year a mandatory reporting that each company which has more than 400 million euro turnover will have to do about what is the share of my green investment whatever investment it is. And of course, inside the investment, you have real estate. And if you have real estate, you have buildings. And if you have buildings, you need to explain that your buildings are green. And the two first indicators of a taxonomy are energy consumption in primary energy and greenhouse gas emission. So how do I prove to an auditor, to a third party auditor, that the information about greenhouse gas emissions of my building are reliable, that it's reliable and they can use this number. Because according to the perimeter you use, according to the way you did to you inform, you can say whatever you want in terms of greenhouse gas because you can't meter it at the end of a building. So it's very easy to say one or 10 if you are always right because if you define by yourself a perimeter, it's fine. The big difference here is we start to have standardized approach about how we calculate it. And this is where it will be very important because for the moment with greenhouse gas, we have three metrics. One metric is what we emit in the national country boundaries. This is what is under the agreement of Paris. Each country has to have objectives in terms of greenhouse gas reduction in its own boundaries, so only what you emit in your own country. The other metrics is the footprint. So you add to this the importation. And for example, for France or for a lot of countries in Europe, you double the greenhouse gas emission between what is emitted in the country plus the importation. So you double it. For example, in, for example, in France, if I take only the national emission, I will be around 300, 400 uh, million tons of carbon per year. And if I look at the footprint, I will go up to 700 million tons per year. And there is a third matrix, which is the life cycle analysis, which is also in kilogram of CO2 per square meter, but it's another way how to calculate it. So you see here you are, and you are already lost. At least I am lost. So that's why we work on this uh, approach with digital approach to create also the tools to manage this complexity and also to offer for the public authority a way or to organize the tender. Because maybe as you know, it's also mandatory from 2026, it would be mandatory for a public authority when they will organize a tender to have insight, inside the tender, an obligation to look at the green impact of their tender. So if they want to have a tender for infrastructures, for tunnels, for road, for building, they will have to express what do they expect in terms of green impact. So here we are for the uh, building. So you see there that we can have at first, the concept of a design of a building with the materials, but in the materials already it starts to be difficult because inside the materials, you have the materials which are from the factory in your country plus the material imported, and it's already two different approaches that you have to select. Then you have, of course, the uncertainty when you design the building with your level of greenhouse gas emissions. Then after, when you have built it, you can check where you were. And in a life cycle approach, standardized on 50 years, you have here the impact of the maintenance. So all the material you have to put or to replace every year, the filters have a greenhouse gas impact. For example, in our, in our systems, 
uh, then you have energy used by the building by itself, plus everything what is plugged to the building, computers, data centers, or uh, cooking, uh, electronics, washing machine in a, in a residential. And each five or 10 years, you have to do big repairs, and then you have a higher greenhouse gas emission. So it all depends, of course, of your indoor environmental class, because your, the result will be different. And you can then translate it into primary energy, embodied carbon. You can measure it. You can even translate it into kilogram of CO2 per person and not per square meter, because you know very well that the most efficient building is an empty building. If you want to do a good building in energy, make it empty. It will be very efficient. This is the best you can do. And if you want to do it even better, you put no, in, no air conditioning, no heating, no lighting. You put it in a cave, 16 degrees all year long. It's perfectly efficient, no energy, very good for the wine. Forget it for the people. This is why we moved out from the cave. It was good at a certain time of human history, 40,000 years ago, but we moved out from it because uh, it's not so comfortable at the end of the day. Huh? <laughs> so, here we are. So, this is quite difficult, and when you want to manage the complexity of all that for a 50 years assessment, with all the uncertainty inside, Hank, what will be the carbon footprint of your product in 49 years? You don't know, and that's normal because nobody knows. <laughs> well, of course, zero. <laughs> so, this is where I'm at, we are. Uh, we have to manage, we have to assume an engineer the uncertainty inside our calculation. And for financial people, it's very important that you assume your uncertainty and your accuracy. When you come to a financial guy and you say, the building will be 50.32 kilowatt per square meter per year. He knows you lie, because it's impossible to have such a precise approach on consumption. So he starts to not trusting you. So when you give a number, give uncertainty inside. Assume that in your calculation, there is always an uncertainty. That's the basic of physics metrics. Then we can also have an approach with a dynamic. We can use uh, all the, let's say, all the uh, uh, standards that already exist in calculation on surfaces and ICMS, IPMS. You know, we have a lot of tools for that. We, of course, have an assessment of indoor quality. We have uh, the standards. We have the work done by uh, Corinne Mondin and Pavel Vagorsky named TEL with thermal, acoustic, uh, indoor environmental quality and light. So we can use easy tools to aggregate the information about indoor environmental quality. Oops, so fast. Missing something? No. <laughs> I think something missing. Yeah, half of a presentation missing. No problem. <laughs> I will do it like this. <laughs> because I wanted to show you also what we do on Digital Twins. Uh, I know we can translate such, such a thing into the digital twins, because as the previous uh, speaker during the keynote said, you need to have a model and data. So if you want to run this on a long life cycle, you need to have this digital twin, and that's what we are working on in order to have a digital twin where we can input data. And the digital twin, for us in Building Smart, it's not uh, a drawing, it's not a 3D, it's a huge database. It has nothing to do with a drawing. Forget about the drawing, it's for architects. Do you have real business, engineers, you work with database. And database are the digital twins because you need data about the components, you will have it from the European product declaration from the products, I think. We have no the greenhouse gas weight of buildings, of components. We will assess this uh, with energy consumption. 
we can have a possibility to look at the lifespan or it will be in terms of maintenance and so on. So it's really important to make this translation and to have a capacity then to translate it because when I have a digital twin like this, I can assess what? The risk of the future. I can tell what is the lifespan of my building. What is the remaining lifespan if a building was built 20 years ago? No, I can say that the remaining lifespan of a building as it is, is maybe 15 years, 12 years, five years, and then I cannot implement only the greenhouse gas emission, but when you, you know how to do a life cycle assessment, you immediately know how to do a life cycle cost. And this is where we are, we need to translate what we have to do mandatory because of life cycle assessment and greenhouse gas into euros. So you see what I mean? Or you translate a kilogram of CO2 into euros. And if you do that, then the investor can take the decision to have a cost optimal with the best product, not only the lowest price, but the price, the life cycle, the lifespan, the cost of maintenance, the energy performance and consumption, and then you can make a decision on a complex approach and not on a simplification, which is only the price. So I hope that investors, thanks to you, in the next year, will not buy anymore the cheapest, but will buy the most cost optimal in terms of life cycle. Thank you. Thank you very much, Frank, for your introduction. Um, I think this is a very exciting moment. Um, if we could have envisioned a situation like this 20 years ago, this would be what we dreamed of. <laughs> to have this, uh, this situation. Yeah, exactly. We, we, we dreamed of that with uh, my, one of my best friends in this uh, field, with Maya Virta. Uh, from Finland, and she was a board member of Riva uh, some years ago, and uh, we drove this on a napkins, I think 12 years ago. And now no, we can do it. Exactly. Thank you. Thank you, Frank. Well, now, how do we deal with sit uh, this situation? Um, this is a very exciting moment. Um, and, uh, of course, the European Commission has started to, well, to, to support the implementation of all those uh, uh, activities. And the Quest project uh, that I mentioned in the beginning is one of those projects that is supporting um, this implementation. Um, it's not moving, there it is. Um, it's about de risking green investments. So, what is this about? This is what we have today. Everybody now is talking about ESG, everybody is talking about sustainability and incredible sums of money are supposed to be invested over the next uh, years and decades to come. Um, but what is behind that? It's basically what Frank just said. We are going to invest in those buildings. We are going to do something with buildings. So in the end, it's a lot of measures. It's insulation, it's glazing, it's pumps, it's building management systems, it's lighting, it's PV, it's all this stuff. It's all going to be installed in those buildings. It's all put together to, well, in the end, buildings, those systems. Um, the big challenge we have here is, uh, that is what, um, what Frank mentioned, is the, the uncertainty. What, what is the result of this? Is this actually working? Of course you can make a theoretical calculation. This will lead you to some kind of value, maybe even 50.32, but there's an uncertainty to it, and we have to handle that. And one of the big problems is quality. We don't build exactly what we want to build, what we planned. The result is different from what we have. And if we now look at the, the target that we have, that in 2050 all our buildings are almost climate neutral, and we do it the way we are doing it right now, well, the uncertainty will be pretty big because we will miss our target. Currently, we are missing performance theoretical performance targets by somewhere between 5 and 30 percent. So theoretically we calculate 50.32, yes, perfect result, but in reality if you look at it in detail 
it's not 50.32, it's 70.32 or somewhere there. And this is what we cannot afford. We cannot invest hundreds of billions of euros on our building stock, not only because it's extremely expensive, but because we cannot do it twice. There is no second opportunity. We have to do it right in the first place. Um, and this is about quality. This is about quality. We have to do it right, and this is what the Quest project are targeted at. We said we cannot afford to miss our target by 30%. We need to reduce this. We need, we need to reduce the performance gap because this is a risk to our investments. Uh, and this is what we looked at. Um, and we looked at three services that we already have that can help us to mitigate this risk to reduce the performance gap. And those are quality management services. Those services exist. They are out there since years, since decades, but they have not been applied or applied on a very small scale. Now I think, and that is why I think this workshop is so important, I think those services will be decisive. They will decide about the success of our investments. Um, within the Quest project, we looked at three services Digital technical monitoring, which is basically exactly doing what Frank just said. We use digital twins of the buildings that help us to automatically monitor, evaluate how buildings are actually performing, and that can support quality management processes on a very large scale. Uh, we also have commissioning management, which is a more expert-based approach, experts being uh, on site. We will hear a little more about that uh, from uh, Ola Tyson, who is going to speak after me, and what you probably all know, green building certifications, very broad scale, um, life cycle focused certification schemes um, uh, that evaluate um, buildings on a, on a broader scale, but are also quite challenging, quite expert based uh, to, to uh, be applied in buildings. So those services are here. They exist and they can be applied. Um, they are all referenced or documented in Reva Guidebook 29, well explained. You can basically just take that and book those services for your buildings. So, why is it not happening? We can build sustainable buildings. We know how to do that. They can be energy efficient. That's, that works. But so far, we don't have this, this application of quality management yet, so we miss our target. So, what, what we can do is we can apply those services and we even have the feasibility to, to certify those processes. And this is very important uh, because quality management is about evaluating, evaluating works, evaluating investments, evaluating assets. So there's quite a bit of pressure in this. So all those services that we have here are third-party quality management services. A third party is doing this. And this is extremely important when you I have heard what Frank said, this is going to be about a lot of money. So we need uh, this third party approach to evaluate. Now, what do we want to achieve with Quest? We want to get those quality management service into building projects, into measures, into investments to help to de-risk those investments. So what did we do? We produced two different tools, one in the beginning and one in the end of projects. The biggest problem that we have for quality management currently is to get quality management into the budgets of projects. In the beginning of a project, you never feel the pain because there's no quality problem. In the beginning, everything is fine. So when you make the budgets, you don't think about quality issues. But this is the moment where the budgets are made. So we have a tool that allows for very simple budgeting of quality management services in a very early stage. You can look at it, it's online. It's very, very simple. You need very little information, but it gives you an indication of what quality management would cost for your project, and you can sort of integrate it into your project. This is at the beginning of a building project, and this is at the end of the building project. And this is about learning. We know that we have those deficits out there. But, and this was one of the big struggles in the uh, Quest project, we do not have sufficient data. We know a lot about individual projects, we have lots of anecdotal evidence, but we do not have the comprehensive, in-depth data. So what we defined is a data set that would help us 
to collect data out of projects in a structured, well-defined way, to aggregate that, and to provide this in a unified way so that we can learn from projects what actually works, what doesn't work, what helps us to improve um, quality management in buildings and to reduce the performance gap. Well, this is what we did in Quest. Um, we put it together in a technical monitoring. It's out here. You probably have found it here in, in the room. Um, it also can be downloaded uh, on the uh, Reverb website and on the website of the Quest project. Um, and um, it can actually help you to integrate quality management uh, into uh, projects. As I said, it's a European project. It's about to, to end in a couple of days, actually, end of May. Um, if you're interested in applying quality management uh, services to learn more about the Quest project, you're very welcome. Uh, subscribe to our newsletter. And of course, listen to my fellow speakers who are going to give you a, a little more in-depth insights uh, into what quality management can do for your investments. So that's the Quest project. And my next, uh, my next speaker will give you an introduction into what quality management actually is and why it is so important uh, is Ola Tyson. He is one of the, I'd say, leading experts on quality management, commissioning management in Europe. He also worked uh, on the Quest project for uh, Sweco, also worked on River Guidebook 29. Uh, well, Ola, let us know what quality management is and why it is so important. Yeah, I, I imagine I know it, but um, welcome. And uh, this is all about knowing what quality management is about, and also about um, also about how the taxonomy will impact quality management for for, for buildings. So um, this is the objective of this presentation, and we just go straight on here, and you can see uh, the technical monitoring that Stefan mentioned. This uh, monitoring process that uh, I, will, I will go in depth with it, or a little in depth with it in, in a moment. Um, it's about monitoring in the end of a construction process or a refurbishment process or whatever. You, you monitor in the end, and then you can adjust target values. You can trim your building to optimize it. And then you have a building commissioning process, which is a more, more expensive thing. It starts in the pre-design phase and continues all over and in the operations phase also. And then you have green building certification, which could be DGNB or LEED or BREEAM or HQE or other systems. They are already well known in the market and, and they, are, they are certified by a lot of, uh, there's a horde out there of, of, of experts helping people with doing that. Actually, a, a green certification system can include a building commissioning process. And a building commissioning process can include a technical monitoring. But they do not always do it. And that's why the Quest tools are actually our budgeting tools and our outcome tools. They are treated as three individual measures in those tools. And uh, there is no guarantee that if you buy a technical quality or quality management process that you get a better quality because uh, unless you get a certified process uh, you know that something they, they actually know what they're doing and this is just an example of that um, next is technical monitoring where I can list up a lot of things that includes in the technical monitoring uh, but it's a digital service where you actually come a couple of months before handover and you start monitoring. Actually, you are extracting data through the BACnet protocol in the BMS system. You're extracting data and you are having a software that compares this data to the desired values and then you get some statistics of to what extent do your building actually meet requirements. Um, then you can adjust and continue the measuring. And you can actually continue measuring until uh, the end of time or until, until the building is demolished and use the monitoring for, for example, reporting taxonomy required measures. This is how it works. 
you, you have a target value that you uh, probably, it's last chance to set target values is at the end of the design phase where you can actually, you can shake your design and you get some target values on the table below. And then you set these target values and you have measured values in the commissioning phase before handover. And then you make an evaluation and then you can actually trim your building to optimum. The building commissioning process is a much bigger thing. It's, you don't need just to be at an office and extract data. You have to be on site and you have to help with target values in the pre-design phase and make several design reviews through the whole construction process and be there and make inspections on site and help the contractors testing the, the right way user training, documentation, and then again, you can continue with monitoring-based commissioning, which actually is more or less a kind of technical monitoring that can continue forever and, and make sure that you can keep up your target values to the end of time. This is how it works in the pre-design phase. Measurable requirements. If you don't have any requirements, you have a bad start. In you make, and I prefer to make operational focused design reviews because operations, they're, they're made, several reviews are made during a design process, but most of them, they are construction focused. But we make operational focused design reviews to make sure that these, we have a good feeling that the targets will be met by this design when we come to the operations phase. In the construction phase, we witness tests and training documentation to make sure again that the performance is according to the target values, the measurable requirements set up in the beginning. And then in the operations phase, we can continue to the end of time. When we talk about green building certification, it can include technical monitoring but it's not mandatory that it includes. It's mandatory that LEED includes some kind of commissioning process, but it's, it's, it's carried out in many different ways. They are not aligned with taxonomy requirements. I come back to that. They work on it. I think, except now the LEED one, that's, that's the, from the US, they don't work on taxonomy, but the other ones, they work on getting taxonomy compliant in some way. And uh, they all work on UN sustainable, um, sustainable Development Goals. What's about these certification? You could say, what do they, they, they don't require that much, they, they, don't, they don't require very much other than just desktop exercises. You make some scorecards that this building is able of doing this and this and this. But, um, and then you could doubt what kind of value does it create for the building owner. But actually this one creates the biggest value as the market is today because it's got a huge marketing value to get a DGNB plaquette or a lead plaquette in the reception of a building. Again, here is a list of what, can, what it can include. Ongoing commissioning can include monitoring-based commissioning. Again, define or review target values, analyze data continuously report, and then at the, at the end, taxonomy-focused reporting on the efficiency of operations. We come back to the taxonomy. And if you ask me why all this measuring around, and that's because if you, this man, he has actually told us that if you can't measure it, we don't have a chance to work with it. This is the EU taxonomy. We have these two upper criteria, climate change mitigation and climate change adaptation. And that's these criteria, financial market participants must live up to these. And I think the reporting, the, 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 the date of reports, starting reporting is in the middle of 2023. 
But what people don't know is that they are going to report the data from 2022, so they are already late. But we have here, again, a requirement for monitoring and assessment of performance. How do we do that? That's different than just a, that's different than just a desktop e exercise. In the EU taxonomy, the mitigation part, there's an Annex 1, Section 7.7. Buildings built before 31st of December 2020, it should have Energy Performance Certificate A. How many buildings out there from before 31st of December are Energy Certificate A, Energy Label A? All of them? Again, we are behind. Buildings built after 31st of December 2020, the building meets requirements of criteria set up, blah, 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 blah. That these are nearly zero energy buildings criteria minus 10%. That means you have to be 10% better than nearly zero energy buildings. And this is, the, these, these criteria are different in each country, but it's, a, it's about, uh, I think, maximum 160 kilowatts is uh, nearly zero energy buildings. If it's a non-residential building of over 290 kilo kilowatts, it should be efficiently operated through energy performance monitoring and assessment. That means now this is the end of the desktop e exercise. Here we start measuring. And then we can discuss how we should measure energy, uh, uh, not only energy, because we know how to me measure energy, but effective operations. And um, we, have, we, have a, we, have, we have a suggestion, and it's in this one, that this book that you actually have received when you entered this conference. It was in, uh, handed over to everyone. And uh, they are in, there's an annex of 17, 17 uh, ways of actually applying sensors to verify effective management of a building. So we go over the taxonomy here. If you have to sort your buildings, if you imagine you are a portfolio owner with, with a, for example, 10 or 20 or 100 buildings, you should sort them to find out can these buildings be in any way, in, can we make invest in, investments to upgrade them to energy label A or better? And then you can use this tree actually to sort your buildings. If it's a residential building, you need EPC class A and then a 30 here climate assessment, that means a kind of LCA, life cycle assessment. And if it's a commercial building, it depends whether it's uh, under 290 kilowatts or more than 290 kilowatts. And if you cross that limit with 290 kilowatts, then it should also be efficiently operated and you need to document it. So again, end of, end of greenwash here. If you have newer buildings after 31st of December 2020, then you can see it's uh, again residential buildings. 30 year climate assessment implemented and monitored. And then you must have, uh, uh, if, you, if you go to the commercial buildings again, you need to have efficiently monitoring of efficient operations. So that's how you will actually see that the taxonomy will impact the way that you verify your building. And Quest is about verification of building performance to make sure that it lives up to the requirements set by the owner. And all owners need to set taxonomy requirements so they are set in the future. This is just a reminder of how we are here, because I've been in the school of Frank, and he told me everything that investors are interested in is return on investment and liquidity and risk. But we are, we are here for this, and that's also why Quest is here. I don't know. Can anyone see what it is? If not, we have an explanation here, then you might guess. So. Remember, to manage quality, 
in your project and use the Quest tool. Thank you. Ole. Thank you very much. Um, this picture is important because this is not an exception. Well, in this detail, it is an exception. <laughs> but there are so many problems that we see in buildings uh, which we cannot afford in the future. We will start to measure building performance. Greenwashing will be over. And if you don't take care of those issues, you will not have class A. You will lose a lot of money. I think this is the big, the big message. Um, we now have a short panel discussion. We have, a, a, I think we'll start with a Slido question and over to, to Jasper. And I would ask our speakers on the, on the panel so far. Um. Yeah, I know. I'll use this microphone. Okay. So, fine. so yeah, we're going to try something. Um, as this is an interactive workshop, what you can do um, is we kindly invite you to participate in our uh, online poll that's co uh, currently live. Uh, it's very easy. You can join to your, um, to your uh, phone or with your laptop with any uh, advice that you can go online with. Uh, so first you go to slide.do, uh, the, the link you see there. Um, you will be asked to enter a code. And the code you have to type in is clima underscore quest. Once you've done that, you will see the multiple choice question that's on the right side here. Um, what do you think will be the biggest issue to get building portfolios aligned with the taxonomy? Uh, option A, lack of reliable building data. And, uh, option B, uncertainty with financial actors on how to meet the taxonomy requirements. Option C, the taxonomy requirements themselves, for example, the, the EPCA thresholds, uh, are suboptimal and, and not effective enough necessarily. Or D, and we welcome you if you, if you, um, if you th think um, of that there is another option that is more important. Um, you can click on others and feel free to add it to the discussion at the end. Um, this slide will be, uh, show, be, will be on during the panel discussion, so you will have um, around 10 minutes to answer this. Um, and in the meantime, we will hold the panel discussion and get back to the live results at the end uh, and discuss it. Stefan, I hand it back over to you. Thank you, Jasper. OK. Um, who has heard? about the EU taxonomy before? Just a quick raise your hand, okay. Well, many, okay. Who has read the EU taxonomy? Respect. <laughs> Good job. <laughs> it's tough literature. <laughs> uh, okay. Um, for, those, for those who didn't wrote the EU uh, taxonomy, you can use uh, a, a website from the European Union named Taxonomy Compass where you type only the, some keywords and you go directly to what you are interested in. Otherwise, uh, I think I, I, only one of the vice president of River uh, had wrote uh, the taxonomy in full, uh, 600 pages, something like that. So if you want only to look at what you have interested in, uh, you can use taxonomy compass because it will be bigger and bigger because as uh, uh, Stefan and Olo said, uh, for the moment, we only tackled two items, but we have four over one, which will be complicated too, and biodiversity, water, circular economy, and the f I always forgot the last one, uh, waste management, I think. Yeah. Yes, thank you for the advertisement. Uh, if you want to know more about the taxonomy, you can have a, perfect, a very important uh, article on the River Journal by Johan Zian Gibel uh, on taxonomy. Thank you, Mr. Vice President. Okay, thank you very much. Um, now, we have heard um, about the deficits in quality that we have in buildings. We have heard about the services that we can apply to mitigate that. And we have heard about the necessity through the uh, uh, EU taxonomy. Um, Frank, do you feel confident that this challenge has reached the real estate industry? Do they know? Are they panicking? Or are they thinking, well, this is just another wave? Do I say uh, the official answer? 
Yes, please. Of course, official answer <laughs> is of course they know, they are prepared, and they are taking care about that, and they will implement it. No, you want the non-official one? Yes, of course. <laughs> they are totally <laughs> lost in translation. <laughs> Uh, well, uh, it's clear that if you go to see an investor uh, in your business saying, I have a very good idea, you will give me more money to do more job, he will fire you out of the door because no one wants to pay more. Uh, that's why we made Quest, because it's about how you generate added value. Because you have a possibility through uh, the commissioning process and the assessment of data to give more accurate data, that could be reliable, then you create value to the building. And this is what you will sell. You will never come to an investor to say, I want more money. You will come to the investor saying, I have a very good idea for you. I will increase your value. And this is what it's all about. Because as I said, it would be mandatory to deliver information which will be checked by third party accountancy what is the level of investment in green buildings, so you will have to deliver uh, reliable data, and reliable means that someone is responsible for the data. And the only way to be responsible for the information is to have a management and quality management system in. And there's no industry in the world without good quality management. <laughs> there is one. There is one, it's yes. our. Welcome. <laughs> you are in the best industry in the world because well, you, have, you could sell quality management from now for the next 20 years, so please do it. It's the best industry to be where you have the most possibility of working. So maybe a question to the audience. Uh, whoever you are in whatever role you are um, in, in building projects, however you are dealing with, with buildings, what is your impression on quality? What's, what are your experiences with quality? Anybody? If I ask Ole, it's going to be terrible because he's, he's working on this since 30 years. I took you some pictures up there, some examples of photovoltaics that actually is, they, they are put on the top of a roof in the best intentions because people want to be compliant with a building code or whatever in energy consumption, then they, they have to be energy producers also to, to, to be compliant. So they, they look up the data sheets of the, the photovoltaic panels and they apply photovoltaics on, on, the, on, on, the, on the roof. And somewhere else in the designer's building, there's a one designing a, a shed on the roof with a ventilation plant in, and it's actually putting the photovoltaics in the shade. Nobody will ever find out. You'll get your, you will get whatever you need of... of, of of stamps from the authorities because you have installed the right amount of kilowatts of photovoltaics, but nobody knows if it works. And that, that's a common issue. And, and um, I think it will be that almost every building that we come to have issues like that, not with photovoltaics, but with something else then. But every, every building has got a lot of issues. And if you're in the business, you should please come and apply for a job, if you can know, if you know anything about this, because we are busy with this job. <laughs> there are shitty buildings enough for all of us out there. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I bet you are busy. Um, so, are there, are there any questions on, on, or any comments on, on quality management in your experience that, that you have made in your individual jobs? Or would you like to comment on that? I think that's a typical, because it's a very typical situation, and that leads us to, to the next presentation because we don't know. For the last three years, we tried to find out uh, what the quality or the situation of quality in, in buildings is. We tried to find good studies on that on a large scale, and it's difficult. There are tiny little studies on some systems, some buildings here, some systems there, but there's a huge lack of, uh, of data on building performance. Um, and this is what we cannot afford. We cannot start the EU taxonomy, evaluate the whole thing. We don't know in detail what is actually happening in buildings. Um, and I think this is also re reflecting probably what we have in the, in the Slido answers here, 
um, that financial actors uh, are insecure. And this is what we experienced in the, quality, in the Quest project also when we, when we talked to the, well, we, we always called it the other side, you know, the, the financial people. Uh, and it's extremely difficult to explain to you know, insurance companies and banks what a condensing boiler is and how it works and why the return temperature matters. And they don't want to know. And they are right that they don't want to know. It's okay. So we have to find ways probably to explain and to, to make this easier. Uh, and we have all the tools at hand. We have the digital twins at hand. Most of those tools will not work without digital twins because we have to scale up. This is not about a couple of buildings. This is about lots of buildings. Uh, so we need those tools. Otherwise, it's not going to work. Frank. Yeah, I, I want also to, to, to make things clear. Uh, we will not shift from zero information and lack of data to 100% knowledge about a digital twin with full information. Just to give you uh, a, a, a vision about what we are working on, when we are talking about digital twins, uh, the first uh, uh, document that we will expect from uh, construction and designers to be implemented to asset owners talks about more or less 50 components of the building. 50. Do you know how much components there is in a building? Who knows? Guess. How many components in a building? 1,000? 1,000. Raise your hand. 10,000? 50,000? Yeah, okay. So, on 50,000 components, when we applied to the to these building systems, uh, a, a vision about uh, criticity, uh, what do we know, what do we have to know on certain components. We limited the first list to 50 components linked to the criticity, so it means how much it costs to be replaced, com combined to does this component will force the building to be closed. So you have components that cost one euro, like, a f like something where that can create uh, a problem of water leakage in the building. It costs one euro, but if it happens, you have to close the, the building. So the criticity is there. It's not only how much it costs, but also what will be the impact if this component fails. So if you apply this criticity approach to the building components, we need to just look at, at, at the first sight, 50 components. But for these 50 components, we need to know more than 35 information inside. Who has done it? Who is the provider? Do I have a maintenance list? Do I have all the information about energy, of this, uh, energy consumption about that? And so on and so on and so on. So 50 components, 35 information. Start with that. If you do so, you start to sell quality to your investor, to reinsure your investor. You can also do it thanks to the European product declaration information links to life cycle assessment and lifespan of buildings. So we start to have information and this is where I really want you to be optimistic. When we draw these drawings about the logbook of a building some years ago, we didn't have access to any of this information and no, we had it because the industry makers and Hank, you are in the room, you can confirm or say that I'm wrong, but the industry makers, they give this information to the market, we have it, we can use it, we can assess the lifespan. Uh, so really, don't be afraid. It's not that you are going to give information about 50,000 components tomorrow. No one wants to have that, but from nothing, to at least have the first step, which is 50 components, 33 inform 35 information in, this is the first step where you can try to work against the lack of reliability. So that's why I wanted to, you to be very optimistic about it. It's not so huge. You are not going to climb the Everest <coughs> tomorrow. Just start to climb Rotterdam mountains. <laughs> no, just a joke, but really it's, it's not so difficult because the data is there. It's just that no one, what is important and this is quest where it is, is to look at this data, put it properly, 
and find who is responsible ab about it because if you have someone responsible of a data, then it's a reliable data. Even if there is a accuracy inside where you say, well, the margin of information is plus minus 10%, 20%. It starts to be a reliable data. So don't be afraid to send data to your investor or between decision makers. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Frank. I think this is exactly the starting point of this learning curve. We just have to start. It's not going to fall from the sky. We have to start collecting. And, and this actually uh, takes us to the next presenter. Um, uh, from the Quest project. Uh, I think we now have via Zoom, um, Ivo Martinak, uh, who was a partner for the University of Stockholm in, uh, um, in the Quest project. And he'll present to you uh, the Quest engine, a data set to improve our learning curve. So now I wonder if we can see Ivo, Ivo on the screen. Jasper, do we have a connection to Stockholm? <laughs> I, I think so. Um, it should be on the screen soon. Hello, everybody. Can you hear me? Yes, Ivo. We can hear you. We can't see you, but we can hear yeah, you. Yeah, I, I am uh, on a somewhat uh, flaky connection. So I, if that's okay with you, if I will join you with my voice. Uh, do you see my slides? Not yet. Okay. I have uh, shared them. And the only button I see, it says stop share. So I, I'm not sure I can do more. We are now more. seeing your slides. Are you seeing them? Yes. Wonderful, wonderful. Perfect. Thank you very much. Um, ladies and gentlemen, uh, very sorry I can't be joining you uh, physically uh, this time around. Uh, I hope the technology will work. Uh, and I very much look forward to participating in the discussion uh, hereafter. And allow me to connect to previous uh, speakers and previous colleagues in basically pointing out that our dear buildings do not perform. And what I would like to uh, say a few words to you about uh, today, uh, under the flag of closing the performance gap by filling the data gap in buildings, uh, will be about uh, the Quest data engine, which was uh, developed as part of the Quest project to actually address the issue, these issues. Uh, also to present myself, I'm, uh, I have two hats. Uh, I am a professor of building services engineering at KTH Royal Institute of Technology in Stockholm. Uh, and I'm also vice president of uh, REVA. So uh, as mentioned and as previously mentioned by the colleagues, buildings do not perform as expected. They do not. Uh, let me tell you from the Swedish example that 75% of all new buildings in Sweden, uh, and they are mainly high performance buildings designed and constructed and commissioned to the latest standard, they do not deliver to specifications, to regulations or to contracts. And that is very frustrating. It's very costly and nobody likes that. Uh, and the ambitious goals have been set in the past for building performance at national or EU level, but have not been met. So the history of non-performance of buildings is long. I, I don't think there is any other industry that has such an egregious history of non-performance. Uh, all I already mentioned, and I will just repeat it, EPD goal for uh, public buildings, which was compliance with near zero energy, roughly speaking, by first January 2019, well, that was not met. And then the next one up two years later, that all new buildings should be complying with similar performance by 1st January 2021. Well, that was not met. And let me tell you, uh, even if you certify your buildings and pay a lot of money uh, for BREEAM, DGNB, Medjugorje, Green Building, LEED, and any other certifications of which there are quite a few around, uh, I can guarantee you that many performance aspects, including, for instance, indoor climate quality, will not be achieved uh, as they should be. They will not perform to specifications and as they should. So we have a bit of a problem. Uh, buildings do not do what they're supposed to do. So how will we then ever succeed in meeting even more uh, ambitious EU taxonomy goals when we have never succeeded to meeting the, the previous goals? What is really not happening? Well, 
the aspects of performance gap or non-performance can really manifest themselves in a variety of shapes, all of them frustrating, all of them costly, and all of them very costly to remedy. So I think all these things should be thought of in the very or from the very early stages of projects if we want to make people happy and actually save a lot of money for our investors. So if we look at energy, well, buildings spend more energy or use more energy than they should. Uh, they emit more carbon and other gases, greenhouse gases, than they should. Uh, they uh, actually lead to increased maintenance and operational costs because they don't perform. Uh, we have operational startup losses, subpar quality of building functions and services. And this is really the essence. I mean, we build buildings to perform and to deliver services to users. If those functions and services are subpar, well, then really our product is uh, not complying with what it should be doing. Uh, other aspects are unsatisfactory indoor environmental quality. I think in times of COVID, finally, uh, we have revived uh, the ever existing uh, or ever needed uh, need to, to comply and deliver good indoor environmental quality. Uh, but unfortunately, this has been in the shadow of energy efficiency and many other priorities. So many even certified buildings uh, do not uh, have or do not give to their users the environmental quality they should be doing. Uh, we have component and system faults, also very costly to, to repair or to make uh, good, uh, especially later on in the projects. Uh, we have difficulties, of course, in achieving targeted uh, building certification levels if we cannot perform to what we promise to do. Of course, disappointing end user experience uh, and mismatch with the business case. Uh, after some time, if we do not deliver to contract, well, you know, <laughs> how this is, uh, we will lose customers. And I think this is not what uh, you uh, want to do. And this is nothing that can be ever attractive to uh, investors. So the performance gap can also manifest itself in a number of other issues, which is the lack of adaptability and flexibility to changing boundary conditions, for instance, changing uh, climate conditions as we are experiencing. Uh, we see expenses change from capital expenditure to operational uh, expenditure, OPEX. Uh, we see that facilities do not meet, maybe in the worst case, regulatory requirements, because this is made, the basics that should always be uh, actually uh, met and fulfilled. And of course, if you sum all this up and, and you know, look at the where is this all leading, well, you can end up in uh, suits and, and, and courts and so on, and there's increased risk and, and liability. Uh, and uh, big uh, costs and consequences by those who will sue us because we didn't uh, give them what we promised to do. So at the bottom of all this, uh, I would dare say, is the data gap. So the performance gap builds and lives on the existence of the data gap. In most buildings, we lack quality assured data on key aspects of building performance. We do not have data. Stefan said this, all has said this, we just do not have good data. We do not have any data sometimes. And we typically do not plan from the earliest project phases for adequately measuring building performance over the building's lifetime. So we do not introduce the need and the modalities to deliver and generate data uh, into those points of a project where they should be introduced in throughout the design process. Also, I will disappoint you even more. There is no unified or standardized approach to collecting data on building performance. Everybody does it pretty much as they think uh, could work. Uh, there is neither a unified or standardized approach to comparing or benchmarking key aspects of building performance. So we, we uh, use different energy and indoor climate simulation tools. And, and sometimes, you know, we end up in the, uh, in the uh, Tower of Babylon, where people speak different languages and, and nobody understands, and we have data that is completely uncomparable because it bit, builds on simulation tools and mechanisms that are completely different from each other. Uh, and in most cases, you know, this is even more surprising, there is no mandatory requirement for continuous real-time or user-adapted data-driven building performance management. So you could see, am I talking about the Middle Ages? You know, why is this happening in the building industry when all other industry or more, uh, most other uh, big industries like the car industry, the pharmaceutical industry, the food industry have really detailed processes and requirements of quality control. 
Why do we not have that? Well, it puzzles me still, uh, but I'm happy because it provides a job. There's a lot of work to do here. So the Quest Data Engine was uh, developed as part of the uh, Quest project to actually fill in the data gap, to document quality management services and to provide data. And the Quest Data Engine is indeed an open source data set for post project evaluation based on a unified data set that allows continuous documentation and evaluation of the impact of quality management services. And it is used to collect uh, and evaluate data on either new construction measures or retrofit measures, but also at the impact of quality management services on these measures. Uh, so collection of data on relevant variables is essential, absolutely essential for the continuous documentation and evaluation of the impact of quality management services on the either technical or the financial or the ESG aspects of building performance. So the Quest Unified data set, which you will find uh, more described in much more detail on our, uh, on our website, uh, consists of four parts. So I will only have time to summarize here. Uh, one is the general building information data set, uh, which is basically used in any documentation of buildings and measures. Uh, the second one is the evaluation of building performance. Uh, it's about gathering and visualizing building performance data as a forecast for new construction or retrofitting uh, and as measured data for the performance that is achieved actually. The third one is on evaluation measures. So uh, since many investments in the sustainability will be made in existing buildings and possibly cover only partial improvements, uh, the third party of the data set collects data on individual measures of improvement in buildings, ranging from very simple adjustments, uh, fiddlings, uh, and, and uh, very fine tuning of operations to very comprehensive uh, rip offs or rip outs, sorry, <laughs> refurbishments, if you want, and anything in between. Uh, the topics addressed in this section include general documentation, prognosis, uh, and evaluation of these improvements. Uh, and the fourth and last. Uh, data set is on the evaluation of the QMS themselves, the, of the quality management services. Um, and it collects data on QMS that have been applied in this process and on the observed uh, and measured or assessed effects of these services on the project and on the performance of buildings. Therefore, it consists of the QMS documentation and the QMS impact evaluation. And it includes two questionnaires that apply as part of a comprehensive post-project evaluation uh, because it asks about individual perceived effects of QMS rather than objective data. Uh, Quest has also developed certifiable processes, which is very important in this context, to verify the application of the data engine. And these can be slotted into, integrated, or applied in parallel with the uh, certification tools, which we know, such as LEED, BREEM, DGMB, Copilot, Miljöbyggnad in Sweden, and so on. Uh, and Quest in this context uh, proposes four aspects of four types of project evaluation. Uh, the simplest one is basic post-project evaluation, uh, advanced post-project evaluation, the next step, certified technical monitoring and advanced post-project evaluation, and finally, total quality management to give a really integrated approach. And the latter, total quality management, combines uh, the advanced post-project evaluation of certificate two with the building certification and the technical monitoring certification. And the users are free to select their preferred building certification, of course, which level is uh, appropriate for them. Also, it should be mentioned that these processes are designed uh, to actually tune in with the uh, formal certification uh, requirements and the international standard ISO, uh, the number you can read here, conformity assessment uh, requirements for bodies certifying products, processes and services. So how do we then meet EU taxonomy goals? Well, let's start by closing the performance gap by filling the data gap. So we need to close the performance gap and close the gap that is the non-existence of good data. We need to provide good data and fill the data gap. And this we do by implementing the Quest data engine as an essential portion of the quality management service process. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ivo. Uh, just to add on your, on your uh, uh, presentation, um, 
the, doc the whole process is documented in the uh, uh, River Technical Manual on, or the Quest Technical Manual here, and to apply it in uh, in, in projects, uh, we have provided a very simple tender document text. So it's basically a two-liner where you can have the, the requirements for documentation according to this in your projects. It's very simple to apply this, very simple, and it's going to be a start of a huge learning curve. Yeah, we're trying to catch up with the schedule here. Okay. This is Agus presentation. It's after that. Is it wrap up? Yeah. No, no, it's, a <laughs> it's after that. Oh. Okay, there was something mixed up apparently. Okay, well, um, I think this is extremely important. At the end of the project, that we collect this data, that we have, that we ask for documentation, that we ask for data whenever we have a new construction, a refurbishment. Uh, or, or an individual measure, we need this data to improve our digital twins. But to do those, to apply those services, we need the money. We need to have those services implemented in projects. And this is where the second tool comes into play that we developed uh, in Quest. Very simple. It's going to be presented by, uh, presented by my colleague uh, from, um, uh, from Copilot, Cormac Ryan, Managing Director of Copilot. He's going to explain to us our little budgeting tool that we created. Correct. Thanks. Thanks, Stefan. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm pleased to be here. Uh, though I'm afraid I have to start off by um, repeating this extremely bad news I heard during this meeting, and that's that greenwashing is over. And I think that's a disaster. I mean, it was great. I, we should continue on with it. Uh, instead of doing a tool for our budgets, we could just say they're going to be green. And then when we're using them, we could say they are green. Um, thank you very much. I'm off. <laughs> um, so yeah, I'm going to talk about the, the, the Quest tool. And um, In a way, we had a situation forever where we have parallel lines. One line, one line is the technical line, building experts, the people here. There's no banks here. There's no financiers. They are the deciders. That's another parallel line. And how do we get these lines to start getting less parallel, ideally to meet? We've talked about the taxonomy because we think this is one of the ways. Um, one thing I learned when I was young, they say the Belgians are born with a brick in their stomach but the Irish are born with two bricks. Let's call them blocks in our stomach. And uh, we love property. Location, location, location. So we can say we don't care if the building is green or not. But that's as a buyer or an investor. If your interest rate is penalized because your portfolio is not green, then there's location, 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 and cost penalties. And that's the market we're coming into. And that's why we've developed this tool because people are looking for solutions, they're going to want to know how much they have to put into quality to get the buildings they expect to get. What do we look at? We want to give you output that is, what's the financial value add of different quality systems? We want to make it very simple because first we tried to make a difficult tool with lots of fine calibrated questions and we found that financial stakeholders cannot answer those questions, as they do not have the technical expertise. So we've gone some, for some very simple questions. What's the type of building? If they don't know what the type of building is, they can just say, is it a complex building or a not complex building? We ask them the confidence they have in their technical teams. That's a surrogate for how well the work will be done, uh, in their opinion. We ask them project cost, OPEX cost, and the investment time horizon. The time horizon is because we're looking at payback, and we want to know what their typical payback, uh, if it's 10 years or five years, and we'll use that capitalization factor when we do our calculations. So we put these all into a, an algorithm that we've developed, and we get the results. 
we get the results for different types of quality management services. And there's been quite a lot of emphasis put in this uh, presentation so far on certification. The reason for that is, it was said earlier, is trust. We want to be sure that what the service should be doing will do, and that's why we add the fact that it should be certified. But the main thing is, is it technical monitoring? Is it commissioning? Is it green or sustainable building? To make sure it's done well, we want the certified versions. What we have is this tool. Uh, just we don't, we don't have an, on an online version, no? OK. <laughs> Normally, I would fiddle with the buttons and show you how it moves dynamically. <laughs> I will not fiddle with the buttons. But the tool is on the Cinevision website. It's on the Quest project website. And it's on the Copilot building commissioning website. You say the type of building, the confidence, the things I mentioned earlier. And at the bottom, we will have the value add per square meter. We will also have an indicative cost per square meter. At the very beginning of this project, it was said that we can't be certain of values. These are indicative values. If you're doing one project, they may be wrong. If you're doing 100, they'll be a good indica indicator. As we generate more and more data as well from our engine, we'll be able to refine the data on this. But this is a way of making those two parallel lines meet so the financiers finally can understand the technical aspect. What do we do in the algorithm? We've based it on research that's been done, academic research, on real projects and on pilot projects that Quest has undertaken. We look at different technical risks and then we see the financial as um, aspects. We see them from the revenue aspect, that's the operating costs. We see them from the investment or capital aspect. And the revenue part, we multiply by the investment time horizon to capitalize it. We add that to the capital aspect. We factor in the technical risks to give the value add. We also obviously have to take into account how the quality management services interact with that. And that was quite a complex bit of developing these algorithms. And at the end, what we give you is, I think, the only simple valuation tool on the market for valuing quality management services. On the, the last slide I'm going to present to you is the takeaway. And the takeaway, as ever, is do, the action verb, do, do quality, do certification. Um, there's different people you can do it with here. You can do it with others as well. Uh, there's uh, Stefan. He has seen a vision. They do the digital technical monitoring uh, for different government buildings in Germany, for example. Uh, we have Ola Tyson with Sweco, who does airports, laboratories, and so on, commissioning and green building certification. And I speak for Copilot. We certify digital technical monitoring. And as we saw, EU taxonomy is very large. We certify certain aspects of that. We also certify commissioning. Um, so what I would like at the end of this is if anyone has any general questions, please place them now. But if we have specific questions for projects and so on, I think there's a number of people here who would be interested to hear from you. Thank you. Permit, thank you very much. I would ask the speakers uh, on the panel um, for a last round of, of questions. Thank you very much. Um, uh, do we have a, a slide questions now? Yes, we do. So we're going to do this again. Uh, first of all, we're opening the last part of this, uh, of this workshop, which is an open discussion on building performance gap. So on the one hand, has the, has the panel, and the audience also uh, has the opportunity to ask questions uh, regarding this. Um, but uh, yeah, to move on, we're going to do the same exercise again, just with a different question. Uh, if this might be a slightly more tricky question, uh, although the taxonomy question was also uh, tricky in other ways. Um, which performance gap has the largest impact on the financial value of building units? You can choose an unlimited amount of answers. You'll see if you go to the poll. 
uh, that you will have quite a lot of uh, potential uh, options. So again, instructions on how to use Slido, you go to slide.do, you will see um, the, the possibility to enter the code as you, in, in the screen you see, like on the screen you see um, where you would see it. Then you type in the code, clima underscore quest, and then you just answer the poll, the, poll, the question is open right now. And I will hand over the floor back to Stefan, you will see the result of the poll um, near the end of the discussion. Jasper, thank you very much. Um, maybe in parallel, I can ask, if, are there any questions to the panel uh, that you would like to ask on the U taxonomy, on the Quest project, on the methodologies that we presented? OK. Yeah, thank you, Johan Zingil from EPE Center. Uh, there are a lot of data, and too many data kills the data, I think. Uh, so it's also a question of how to reformulate, how to resume them. Uh, when I see that, for example, because we are talking, we said uh, there is one silo which are the bankers and the other silo are the building people. I see that, for example, in Germany, the Kreditanstalt für Wiederaufbau, they try to have to understand if the uh, uh, energy performance certificate is reliable or not. So they ask for a second layer of data to, to be able to check if, uh, if it is correct or not. So I think it, it is very interesting. What is a pity is, well, I don't know, it's a, a, always related to the German building code regulation, of course, then to the German calculation method. And then you cannot, so, well, and then, so I, I just wanted to say that there is already a data layer and that this idea of data layer, I think is very much important because when you come then to another tool which is linked to Quest, which I see, which is a calculation method because you will use it as a target then, of course, uh, there should be a link to the measured data. So it's also related to this, so it's a data structure. So I wanted just to know if you have made an exercise to, 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 to see how the data are structured in other approaches, for example, in the different calculation methods, for example, in the different uh, bankers' requirements, as I just mentioned, the Kreditanstalt für Wiederaufbau, in order to, to introduce a common, a common structure and to avoid that with each European project, we have a new data set. Well, I think that's probably a question for me. <laughs> uh, yes, we looked at other projects. We looked at other data sets. Uh, we have the deep database. We have uh, looked at other uh, projects like AAA, E-Invest, et cetera. Um, and uh, what we I don't think we would, we would say this is a, the unified data set. This is certainly not the final data set. Uh, but I think one advantage is that it's easy to be applied. You can, it's, it's very easy to integrate this, this data set um, in, in your projects, and that helps you to, to generate this standardized data. Um, I think looking at the content and the structure, it is in, in some parts similar. So even if you would try to connect other databases, I think that would be feasible. Although we did not try to you know, build the one big uh, database or, or structure. Yes. Maybe just an additional question to this. I don't know the data structure in, the cli in, uh, in Quest, mm -hmm. but I think this idea of a data layer is very interesting because, of course, when you go to the calculation methods, then it is like uh, you have 1,000, uh, I don't know how many input data, but for example, you do not need them for a banker. It's not important to understand, mm -hmm. for example, the thermal bridge, okay? But for him, what is interesting is already an aggregated data structure. And mm -hmm. this, is, this is why I found this idea from the credit for the German bank, very interesting, to introduce this 
data structure layer in order to be able to check just under the highest level, which is maybe the class A or class B or class C, to check if the A or B is reliable or not. So do you have also this idea of data layer in, the data, in your data structure? Um, this, this layer, I think, is part of, of, the, of the data set that we have, although it's not linked uh, to, to uh, the, the, the concepts that you, you uh, described. Uh, what is more important for us, I think, here was the idea of uh, going into more detail on certain aspects, on the performance aspect and on the aspect of the impact of quality management services to, to improve or improve quality and reduce performance gap. So that's the focus here. So I think it can be added with other uh, um, methodologies for, for data collection. Um, any other questions? If not, I would have three fast questions to, to our panel. Um, Cormac, you skipped over it very fast, but the number that you gave for payback are incredible. If you look at the, the return on investment on quality management services, those are fantastic, aren't they? Yeah, um, the return on investment is, is, is huge and one of the reasons is I think traditionally in the building industry, um, normally when you do a budget, you do a budget with uh, various bits of figures and it kind of adds up to 100% with all the bits of figures in it. And I think in building you kind of do a budget that there's this kind of bin of 10 to 20% that everyone knows about. Um, that's been there since we were building Adam and Eve's hut in the Garden of Eden. And it, everyone accepts it, and it's been there. Well, that, that it, we're not going to eliminate it totally, but a lot of that money can be saved. And that's before we talk about energy savings and so on. But, so yeah, um, in, if we talk concretely, the, the return on investment, I mean, we're, we're, as far as the investment on quality goes, you're getting a, a, a multiple of savings. When I say a multiple, a multiple in, in the several hundred percents. Um, on the quality investment. And when we look at, for example, I think in Germany, in um, the, the waste, it's calculated over 15% of the building industry every year is, is, is wasted investment. In France, it's over 12%. And I think they're indicative markets. Yeah. This is incredible. It's much more uh, cost-effective than any other investment that you probably have in, in your building. Ola, at Sueco, I mean, everybody must be calling you for quality management services. How is the situation? Is that changing? Of course they want it because now it's fashion and they can see that it's necessary. And when we talk about return on investment, it's a, it's a very good business to invest in better quality. And uh, the figures we have that we constantly try to improve through the Quest data engine, they are excluding the benefits of taxonomy because what, what, what does it cost, for example, if if an owner cannot, uh, cannot uh, keep his money in the green revenue streams, that will be extremely costly. No access to green bonding and whatever he, he wants to do. So, so that can be very costly and will be on top of the calculations that we have already in the calculation tool. So they want the services of our commissioning team in Sueco. Um, and of course, as any other project manager, they want it for free but that's not possible. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, Ola, last question, Frank, to you. Uh, maybe this, these answers are a little driven by the audience <laughs> and the fact that they are all engineers, uh, but I think the awareness that we have a problem here is, is big. Now, we have the tools, we have the environment, legal environment. What are the next steps? What is the most urgent thing we need to do? As Olo said, uh, as we will have this mandatory reporting next year, uh, and uh, for an investor, it's uh, it's a risk. But if you don't, if you are not in capacity to prove that your building is green according to taxonomy definition, or is on track to be green, because for example in France, uh, we have a new regulation which is mandatory that every office building has to declare on a national platform, it's energy consumption plus 
the plan to reduce the energy consumption in the next 10 years. So if you are not green or on track to become green, you are out of the market. So it's not that you will have uh, a, loss, a loss of money. It means that your building will not be liquid at all. It's what we call a stranded asset. And a stranded asset, it's a building that you can't sell or rent anymore. And again, if I take an, an example as the French regulation, from 2028, it will not be possible to rent or sell an apartment which will be class G. This is a stranded asset. You can keep it for you. You can do what you want inside, but no more income and no more value because you can't sell it. So it's, it's really where we are. The next step is that the goal of a regulation is to kill the value of a non-performing building. It's not that we are talking about return on investment. We are talking about is my building will have value or not. <laughs> and it's 22, 28. So it's a huge, very important to understand that you have a lifespan of buildings which is according to the quality of the components. And, and the second lifespan or obsolescence is according to the use you can do with a building. For example, an office building in, uh, 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 in, in La Défense has a lifespan of 20, 25 years max, because every 20 years we change everything. We just keep the skeleton. Uh, a lifespan of a residential building can be uh, 50 to 400 years if you have a castle. Uh, but in terms of new regulation that will put in place, it will mean that your building that you have in mind, this kind of lifespan, will be stranded in maybe in five years. So it's, a, it's really a, a huge shift that the regulators wanted to make at European level and also in each member states. And it can be solved only if you can prove that your building is on the tracks. So, or you can prove that yeah. only with data. But who will believe you? Only the data are certified or reliable. Otherwise, I don't believe you. You will want it to sell me uh, an office building saying, well, look, I'm on the tracks. OK, who has certified that? Who, who or is it real? It's like putting your money in the bank, and after 10 years, they will say, oh, sorry, bank is closed. <laughs> this is where we are. I think people don't understand the, the, the acceleration uh, of the impact of the regulation. It's like the same acceleration of the climate change. No one wants to imagine what will happen in the next five years because it's not a linear acceleration, it's an exponential one. So it will be much more worse than today. And the same for the valuation process and the way we assess the building. So the people who will not have the data, it's not that as of today, oh, you don't have data, who cares? Who cares? Today, if I, I was at the MIPIM a couple of months ago. I got the COVID, by the way. But, <laughs> but uh, not, it was a really, a, a real, uh, a super spreading event. Uh, but if you look at, you ask the investors, well, are you collecting data about the quality of building? No, who cares? If I don't have data, I put it on average. But this is the end of this way of thinking. No more data tomorrow will mean I put it as the worst building because I don't know, and it could happen, that it will have no more value in the next five, 10 years. And, and in terms of in investment on, or of the way we evaluate the building, it's totally different. It's like in Rotterdam. You're in Rotterdam, they know very well which building will be flooded in 2035. So they have a plan to help the people to build another uh, top floor and to maybe access to the ground floor with a boat. If you don't do the same with your buildings in uh, the next 10 years, you will be flooded or stranded. <laughs> okay, I think the real estate industry is not really set for this speed. We'll see. No, it's clear, they, but when it will come, uh, we have to be prepared, yeah. the industry makers, are prepared, they make the, the, uh, the factories to deliver products to achieve uh, energy efficiency. And we as designers, engineers, uh, we have to be, and architects, we have to be prepared to this wave because uh, it will be very fast. So, 
so the stage is set. We can, we can start. We better start. And uh, maybe for you as engineers, we can see we talked about not only about technologies, about heat pumps and LED, etc. We talked about services. Yeah. And services is for engineers. This is an opportunity for engineers. We need good engineering services here for better quality management to be successful here. Thank you very much to the panel. Thank you very much, colleagues, for the work in Quest. Go to our website, check the Quest website, try to apply quality management services in your projects. Thank you very much for attending our workshop. Thank you.